Okay, so is everybody muted or everybody's on? You're all open for talking too. So welcome to Mindful Monday. And we're all very excited, Debbie and I are very excited to see you all again. And uh, before we get started, I just wanna mention that if you have any questions, feel free to just chime in and speak and you can come on and everybody, if you don't mind everybody seeing you uh, and ask your question and we can talk together about it, even if it's a personal issue that you're open to sharing. Uh, if not, you can just type it into the chat room and Sarah, our wonderful Sarah who's here is going to be taking those questions and reading them. So feel free to type in your questions. Um, and tonight we're going to be talking about, why don't you introduce the topic tonight? So uh, tonight the topic is all about surviving an affair. And um, this is such an important topic because the incidence of infidelity is quite high. I think it's like in the 40, high 40s. You know, if you get online and you look, there's different statistics all over the place. But it's definitely, you know, quite a bit. And we deal with quite a bit of this in the office. And not all infidelity happens for the same reason. And not all relationships are in the same state of affairs before the affair happens. And these two factors really drive the success or failure of um, their pathway to recovery. And one of the things that we believe strongly, that if both parties um, are really at the table to recover, that recovery is not only possible, but the actual relationship ends up being much stronger with more integrity into it, in it than it had before. Because let's face it, Affairs don't happen in perfect relationships and no relationship is perfect beyond the romancing phase because all the warts and the challenges and the stresses and the realities of being in a relationship come to bear. And for whatever reason, we're drawn outside for one night, for one year, for one month, whatever. And the, the gift of an affair is that it really shakes the whole structure up. And when both people are present and at the table, there's an opportunity to look at what happened and there's op opportunity to revision a new beginning. And that's really what's required is like starting all over. You know, like things went wrong. We don't want to go backwards, but we want to fortify our relationship, renew it, strengthen it um, so that we're in a, in a better position moving forward. But that doesn't always happen. It's like a lot of times when affairs happen, not both, both people aren't at the table. One decides, you know, to, to move on or they're just half-heartedly there. So what we're talking about is a process and, and what we use when couples come in and they're really both at the table. And um, one of the things that we're going to highlight is how to keep you there at the table with a lot of integrity and hopefully gearing you up for success. Right, right. So um, yeah, let's maybe talk a little bit about what we're talking about. What is a betrayal? What is a uh, what is an affair? What is an affair? Okay. You know, I mean, I, I think in, a, in in the simplest terms, um, a betrayal is a lack of trust, uh, a break in the trust, right? So, and what do we mean by trust? So, you know, one of the things, interestingly enough, when I have new couples who are getting married for the first time come into the office, one of the things we have a conversation about is monogamy. Um, you know, we kind of put it out there on the table because I don't want to take anything for granted. And so uh, I asked them, you know, uh, are you expecting this relationship to be completely physically exclusive to just the two of you? You ask your premarital couples? I discussed that. I asked them. Yeah. And have you ever had a premarital couple say no? Yeah. Really? I have. And I have. Were they both on the same page or was it? They were both on the same page and they were um, kind of, you know, had already kind of explored different options. Right. And so they came in with that. Mm -hmm. um, and some uh, have thought about it and talked about being able to do something a little bit different at some point in time, but maybe not right now. Um, but regardless, I think it's an important conversation because uh, a betrayal is a break in that agreement. Uh, if you tell your partner that I am going to be exclusive with you and you have that, that commitment to each other, that verbal commitment, uh, that verbal promise, then a betrayal is a break of that promise. 
and you know, we talk about emotional affairs and that's where it gets like a little bit gray. So if I say, if you say to me, um, are we going to be monogamous? I take that for granted that that means sexually monogamous mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that any sexual activity going outside is a betrayal, right? right? And, but we still may need to drill down. Like what is it, what about hugging or kissing or, you know, mm -hmm. so there may be some need to, to drill down, but I think what often happens that we see are emotional affairs. Yeah. And I like to think of emotional affair, affairs as the trailhead to more physical affairs. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about like what's an emotional affair and is that a betrayal? Yeah. Or when that yeah. is. And just to add on to what you're saying about different types of affairs, I mean, it's very interesting to think about um, other like social media and um, things like um, pornography, for example, or uh, uh, having uh, conversations online uh, with women and whether those are, you know, considered affairs or not, because there, there's so many different ways that it can be interpreted, particularly with emotional affairs, though, I think everybody would, would probably agree that uh, if, if you're opening up being very vulnerable with um, someone else, but not with your partner, like if you don't have that comfort level to be transparent and open with your partner on an emotional level, to let them know what your needs and wants and desires are and feel that those needs and wants and desires are being met. So you have to go find somebody else to talk to about those needs and wants and desires that are not being met, then that can be really tricky. That can be an emotional affair. And I, I, I don't know your experiences, but mine has been that that can be even more painful than a sexual affair at well, times. Yeah, I think it's so easy to fall into because when we're in relationships, again, like, you know, we're dealing with runny noses and diapers and um, aging parents and so many stresses. Yes. And so when I come home, you may not get the best of me. That's right. I'm stressed out. I'm aggravated. I told you about this damn dishes, yeah. you know, and so we don't really bring the best of ourselves to the table. And then we go off to work and then there's this guy and he's hot and he's present. And when he looks at me and says, how are you doing, Debbie? It feels like I'm being seen, right? Yeah. And so it's not really a fair comparison, right. but it's intoxicating. Yeah because it's new and it's fresh and it's present. And a lot of people in, in affairs often say like, I felt like she saw me. Yeah. I felt like he saw me. Yeah. And that's kind of unfair because, you know, our partner at home doesn't see you because there's so much going on. Yeah. Yeah. And, but that's why emotional affairs, are, I think, are so intoxicating. Yes, and, and I, would, I would even say that in our experience, um, affairs often are a result of restraints uh, of trying to break out of the restraints of of marriage of conventional marriage where i mean if you anybody of us can imagine what that's like to have three kids at home uh little kids um you can barely take care of yourself you know you're you're just you're exhausted your kids are going off to school you're taking them transportation everywhere you're working full time you know, you're trying to prepare meals, you're doing the shopping, you're doing the washes, you're doing everything to take care of life. And it's hard to connect on that erotic part or that sexual part, sensual part of yourself with your partner. And oftentimes the relationship takes a nosedive. And so we, we are often find ourselves wanting that or missing that because well, I can't tend to you. Like if I'm so overwhelmed, yeah. I can't tend to your emotional needs. No. I can't be there for you. Right you know, the way maybe somebody else can. Right. And so when somebody actually sees me and listens to me and looks me in the eye, yeah. well, maybe they're doing it because, you know. Right. <laughs> but I feel taken care of and they feel seen. Right. And, um, and again, it's just so intoxicating. Mm -hmm. And I think we tell ourselves, and this is why I think it's a trailhead mm -hmm. to physical intimacy, we tell ourselves, we're just friends. Yeah. No big deal. Right. We're just friends. Right. And I think where it starts to get dangerous with emotional affairs is when I say we're just friends, but somehow it just feels wrong. Mm -hmm. And I start thinking about this person more than I'm thinking about my spouse. Mm -hmm. I get up in the morning and I'm just getting dressed. Maybe I'm just putting a little bit more attention to how I look. Mm -hmm. And maybe I can't wait to see that person. Mm -hmm. And maybe when I'm there, I'm my best self. Right. Right, and that's like the trailhead into this connection. I had a client that um, they had a really strong emotional affair, and it was just so present, so loving, and so connected, and so beautiful. 
and then they turned it into a physical affair and then he got caught yeah. and he was like why did we do that it was so beautiful mm -hmm. like i would take that back that mm -hmm. physical connection mm -hmm. to have that emotional mm -hmm. connection and the wife is sitting there saying oh this yeah. is so painful mm -hmm. which gets back to why the emotional affairs are really so yeah. painful yeah 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 so what are some of the other reasons people have affairs? Maybe we should talk a little bit about that. There's not just one reason. Yeah. There's so many reasons. We're not going to spend too much time here, but you know, it's important just to understand that there, there are so many differences. I mean, one difference, I mean, one reason would be that there's a lack of sexual compatibility. It may be that my sexual drive is just up here and my husband's is down here or vice versa. Sure. It may be that, you know, my spouse really doesn't even like sex anymore. Yeah. Or they're not very good at it because they had sexual abuse and they're constrained and I feel, I want to feel my sexuality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if my partner doesn't want to work on it, um, I just feel like I'm going to explode unless it's expressed. So I think that would be a common reason. That is a common one. One that I see a lot is, um, so, you know, we have this erotic part of ourselves. This is the part that really feels great expressing our sensuality with each other and feeling it. And some couples, not all, but some couples after they've been married for a while, that erotic part of themselves that maybe was expressed a little bit more freely at the beginning of the relationship starts to get repressed. And it does happen with kids, it happens for different reasons, right? But when that erotic part becomes repressed, it's still there. Maybe it's a little flame and it's only this big but it's still there and you know it's there and you feel like you've lost part of your identity. And so we definitely notice that a lot of couples will come in and the partner will have cheated because they're trying to reignite that part of themselves, that erotic part, and they don't want to lose it. They're petrified of losing it. We see that from time to time. Yeah. I, I, the other one I see a lot of is um, like, it's just, it's kind of like the work thing, mm. but it's just a more fun connection. Like, you know, when your kids are in the same school and you're going on trips together oh, yeah. and you start developing just a lot of, like a, a good solid friendship, Right. you know, and you just, you, you're in the flow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's familiar and it's fun. Mm. And then all of a sudden there's just like, whoa, there's a chemistry here. Mm. And then that just goes down that path. Definitely, definitely. Another reason that we see a lot is, um, and I, I keep bringing the kids up, but um, we do see a, a lot of couples where one of the, typically the woman feels really constrained with the kids. You know, their our identity gets, um, what's the word, where everything gets squashed, squashed into like one <laughs> thing. You know, I'm a mother, that's all I am. And, right. you know, women wanna, re-experience oftentimes what it feels like to be that sexual being after kids. So oftentimes you'll see affairs begin up as the kids are kind of beginning to get launched a little bit and I want to really re-experience, reignite that part. You know, and then of course there's those who just really want to get out of the box and explore very whole different variety of, of sexual parts of themselves. And as Debbie was saying earlier, they may not feel like they have a partner where they can do that. Um, and so, you know, that's where porn is often explored. And, uh, you know, sometimes porn, although porn is not specifically having an affair per se, uh, you know, a lot of people will feel very um, concerned about a partner's use of porn if they're not included in it, if it's a private thing where only they can do it by themselves. It can feel like an affair, like it's replacing our sex life. So that's another area. Um, I have a client where their partner is disabled and is unable to have uh, sex. So she had to make a decision about whether to cut that part of her life off or to continue to have an affair. And she decided she would have an affair and she discussed it with him and he was open to supporting that. So is that an affair? That's a good question. Is an affair an affair if a person describe discusses it with their spouse and their spouse agrees to it? You know, I don't think it's. I would affair. say no. I don't think so. Yeah. And that does happen. You know, um, I've said to Debbie that you know we're we're in our sixties. If I was in my thirties, 
and we were married for 30 years, let's say, um, and I wanted to have an affair, I wanted to go outside the relationship, I would talk to her about it. I would have a conversation with her. And I would say, you know, and it wouldn't be, I probably, for me, it would it's probably be. It's easy to say, but if it were yeah, actually, it'd would be, you? It'd be a little scary. It'd be a little scary, <laughs> but I might give it a shot. <laughs> I would it's a give it a talker. shot. I would. I, I think it would be, my guilt would just get the best of me. And I have a real problem with guilt. So, uh, you know, um, I had another uh, couple, but they were old. They were, they were in their 60s. They were older. And, um, the the guy was really feeling old and he wanted to feel young again so he in order to sort of deal with his aging issues he decided to and you see that a lot look for a younger woman who could make him feel like he was still young so that's another reason we see people going out and having affairs so there's so many reasons and you can't put it in a box you know one of the first things we explore when we meet with couples who had an affair is, is why, you know, why did you have the affair? What was it that led you to do this? So tonight we're really focusing on like surviving an affair. So we're presupposing that both parties are at the table as best as they can be with the common intention of rebuilding. And some couples are really good at this. I mean, they just zip through it because their desire and their vision for a new future is strong and they want each other so badly. And so they go through the process of healing. They get to that new beginning pretty fast. Other couples um, get really stuck. And a lot of it has to do with the prior relationship. And sometimes the prior relationship has to do with early tra um, childhood trauma in terms of forgiveness and, and getting over things. And a lot of the stories about the individual with, you know, that were there before the affair just get exacerbated and they blow up like a big balloon. True. And so all of that has to be worked out. And Craig and I, um, we were talking about it today as we normally do when we have one of these Mindful Mondays because we have separate practices and we approach it differently. And as we talked about it, we realized that we really approach it in a very similar fashion. And we realize that there's really three phases to the work that we do. And the first phase is what I would refer to as asking questions, finding out what happened, why did it happen? And there's a gazillion questions that one is gonna wanna ask. And this is a really, you can call it the discovery phase, right? Mm -hmm. This is such an important phase and it's a difficult one yeah. because it's enough to find out that you cheated it's another to start getting the details. And, you know, depending on our relationship, some of them can really, really hurt. Yeah, like, why did you do it? Like, why what did, did you do? Yeah, so I have a list of questions, and I'm just gonna read them off. Um, While she's getting ready with these questions. I'm ready. I want to, well, just let me just share one thing. I mean, this is crisis time, right? This is rage. This is outright rage to despair. This is, I, I'm very vengeful. I feel helpless. The confusion and the overwhelm during this stage is enormous. I mean, what we are trying, Debbie and I often have to, you know, really contain uh, the emotions because they're so intense and they're so confusing. And what you hear is a lot of conflict. You might hear something like, leave, don't leave. I love you. I hate you. Hold me, don't touch me. I wanna stay with you. I'm not sure I wanna stay. I love you. I'm not in love with you. How could you do this? You're sick. You know, these are the kinds of things that, I mean, it's, it's intense, the anger and the overwhelm. And so, but that is a stage. And the questions that we ask during that stage are, are allowing the person who was cheated upon to feel safe enough and that they can then begin to ask the questions that they really need to know the answers to. And it's some so of the questions. When, when we, usually the way I do it, I don't know if you do it a different way. I mean, I've done it different ways, but um, we have a list of questions. It's not exactly this list. And we're more than happy to send the list to you guys if you'd like it. Um, but we avoid questions like, well, how many, how long, did you have sex for or what positions did you use you know things that you start getting a visual and that's hard to erase i always say if it's really important for you to know that go ahead and ask it 
but it's not going to be the most helpful question in terms of moving forward and healing. There's a lot of uh, questions that are just so much more helpful in terms of understanding the nature of the affair and, and making more meaning out of it. Right. So let me just read some of these. Usually what I'll do is I'll give the, the person who was hurt the list and I'll say, circle the questions. A lot of times I'll give it to them before the session. Sure. Circle the ones that are really important to you because there's a lot on this list and I'm not gonna read them all, but I'm just gonna give you a sense of them. And they'll circle them, they spend time with them and they pick the ones that are really meaningful. Um, so here are some questions, questions that are on the list. Um, what did the affair mean to you? Why did it happen when it happened? What were you looking for? Or were you looking for it? Did it just happen? Did you feel entitled to your affair? Do you feel guilty? What did you discover about yourself and that relationship? And how do you feel about that? Did you discover new parts of yourself or recover lost ones in that relationship? What do you think could not express your, why do you think you could not express your needs to me? Emotional, intellectual, or physical? Do you think you could show me those newly discovered parts? Are there parts of you that you want to bring into our new relationship? Was your lover someone you thought you could build a life with? How important was sex? Did your affair have anything to do with something missing in our sex life? Did you ever get to the point where you felt you were losing yourself or felt torn and confused? Were you drawn by the general idea of having an affair or did you feel pull, pulled toward this specific person? And there's a lot more. And again, we'll um, be more than happy to send these out to you. But you can see the, um, the depth and the richness and the importance of these questions. Mm -hmm. And even though asking questions and finding out what happened and understanding the territory of the affair is the first phase, you can see where it's already starting to build toward building a new relationship. A new beginning, which is the third phase. And this this stage, this first stage, is the hardest for the person who did the cheating, because they have gone from you know being an honest person to being a liar. They have gone from being uh, somebody who brought joy to this person to somebody who's just brought pain and suffering to this person. Now, for them to sit and listen and answer patiently all of these questions is so challenging for a lot of these people, whether it's the woman or the man, because they are scared. They're scared that, you know, how much do I say? They're scared, uh, will they ever forgive me? Will this ever work out? Is it even worth it? Right. It's right. really, really hard for them. and they also feel very guilty, extremely guilty. And so, you know, to sit there patiently and lovingly and empathetically and answer all your partner's questions about the affair is no easy task. So we know what we're asking them. And a lot of them can't do it. And we learn very quickly, right in phase one, that this, is, this relationship is right. over. And that's why the prep part for this is so important. Um, and when we're dealing with um, a couple and we're going through this, this phase of, of listening and asking questions, um, we really spend the time prepping them for success. And so when you're dealing with the hurt person who's asking the questions, it's like pick the ones that are really important to you and ask them in the, in the mood of, of curiosity and love because it's not easy for that person to sit and listen to it. As you said, they're in a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. And when you receive the question, mm -hmm. receive it in the um, spirit of curiosity and love and patience. Yeah, which is almost impossible for them to do. Yeah, and that's why we really slow them down with, um, you know, repeating the question. Right, mirroring. And mirroring, a lot of mirroring. Yeah. We slow it down a lot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's where it helps to have probably a therapist to go through this process. Because it is, as you mentioned several times, it's very tricky territory. Okay. And the whole thing can implode. And it does yeah. um, if they try it on their own. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. like, get the hell out yeah. of the house. Yeah. I hate you, you know. Yeah. And it really doesn't have to be that way. No. No. And, and it doesn't happen in one, you know, this, 
we're going to talk about phase two now. But phase two, phase three, which is the repair process, is um, oftentimes you have to skip back to one. I was telling Debbie, you could be in the repair process in stage three, and things are, seem to be going much stage well two. on stage <laughs> two or three, yeah. where you're back and you feel like you're on track to really healing this and right. you're doing well, yeah. and all of a sudden you drive up a right. certain block and it triggers the person, right. and you're back, back in stage on one. one yeah. So it's, it's right. very interesting. It doesn't just go in a linear fashion. You know, and you mentioned it, and I agree with you. It's like the, the person who betrayed wants to skip right over phase one. Right. Like, you know, how many questions do I need to answer? When will this end? Right. She'll never forgive right, me. Right, right. Right. And so they just want to skip right to the new beginning right. with another partner. It's like, I need to know. And, there, mm. and it's because there was this black hole that somebody else was with you. And right. I don't know anything about it. And I need to understand yeah. it. I need to know. So let's so go to phase two. two. So phase two is, um, what do we call phase two? Um, building the trust. And... So you have your questions answered, and now it's like, what does it take for you to trust me? Mm. And that's an individual question for the couple, and it's one that we have to field in therapy. But what is it going to take? What does he have to do, or what does she have to do to build your trust? And you have to kind of navigate this very carefully, because if you approach it of, I'll never trust him again in my life, and he's going to have to show me his phone 10 times a day, I have to call him every five minutes, um, it's not going to work. So you, you um, maybe that will work for a short period of time, and maybe that's necessary. But there's got to be an end to it. And the spirit has to be: I want to do. I really want to build trust in you. Mm -hmm. I don't want to look at you like a pariah or somebody that's ruined my life. Mm -hmm. I want to look at you as somebody that I loved that has betrayed me. I want to get over it. I want to mm -hmm. trust you again. There are a few things that if you could do would really make me feel safe. Right. But I want to get to that new beginning too. So that would be blame to understanding. Yeah. Right? Going from blame to understanding, going from crisis to opportunity. And, and in that, you're going to examine the whole decision of why did the affair occur? How did they justify the affair? You're really curious, as Debbie said. You know, you want them to tell the story of the affair the con in the context of the relationship. So, you know, to be listening and to really begin to understand what happened, why it happened, the motives, the feelings, what was the meaning of it for the partner, as Debbie was saying, you know, um, help me understand, here's some of the questions, help me understand. Are you what, talking about phase one? Phase two. This is phase two. Yeah. Help me. Un made up these phases. Help <laughs> me understand what the affair has been for you. But isn't that, isn't that the question phase? Isn't that like when you're questioning and trying to understand, making meaning of it? It can go right into phase two where there's, you're exploring it even deeper now. Right. So I think, level. yeah, I think phase one, trying to understand what and yeah, how and why right. and all that and stuff. some of the details. Goes back, goes, it flows into phase two. Sure, sure. But for me, phase two is um, like, what do we need to do to demonstrate trust, right. to build trust? Okay. What's going to build that? Right. Do you need me to, like, let's say the, the lover was at work and mm -hmm. he's coming into contact with her every day. Mm -hmm. What is it that you need to feel safe mm -hmm. and that this is, we're on solid ground? Right. And I think if it were me, I'd need something, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe for me, it would be, I need you to tell me for at least a week, like, you know, how this relationship has changed and, mm. and, and what if any contact you're having right, and right. Um, I need to, you know, have a conversation with you about how you're doing and how I'm doing. A lot of reassurance. Yeah, a lot of reassurance, a lot of building back trust, right, right. a lot of activities around that. That makes total sense. Anybody have any questions yet? Feel free, feel free to jump in with questions. You know, we really want to hear them. Um, so, um, you know, in a sense, I think what Debbie's talking about is integrating the whole process, like finding meaning in it of, of some sort. And I think that you need at this point to create a vision for your relationship. And sometimes that was, that's what we begin to do. We begin to start talking to the couple at this phase about, okay, this is never going to be the old relationship. And in some sense, you have to grieve the old relationship as it was and let it go and move on and think about, okay, now what is it going to take to create some structure around our relationship so this never happens again? And now we're clear why it happened. Or we at least vaccinate ourselves. We vaccinate ourselves. Days, but yeah. yeah, against the 
potential of that happening. Sure. Well, we didn't have that in place probably before. Right. So that's phase three. So phase three is building a new relationship, a new beginning. And I love phase three because um, it's exciting and it's rich with possibilities. And it's rich with possibilities because we, through phase one to phase two, we started to uncover a lot of things in the relationship that got lost, that weren't there anymore. And, and now in this building a new relationship, it's like, wow, we can actually bring that in. Our sex life kind of went down the hill. And you know, now we can talk about what's gonna create more connection, more intimacy, more eroticism. Wow, we didn't really connect with each other emotionally. We got so brought up, brought down with the kids or involved with the kids, we lost each other. Wow, maybe we need to install, you know, dates and connection. And we, you know, and I find that couples really, really want that. And yeah. when they start putting that back into their relationship, it gets excited. Yeah. yeah we so have a question. Um, we have a little bit of time remaining. It looks like we have a question. Yeah. So great question here. How long do you stay in the crisis management phase? And I would actually tack on to that as well. How long is it appropriate to stay in that mm. phase? Yeah, that's a great question. We might have two different answers. I'm not sure. I want to hear what Debbie has to say. Well, I, I would say that if you're thinking of crisis management stage, phase one, stage one, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and phase two, understanding what happened and the building of trust back, I would say as long as it takes for the hurt partner to feel safe again. And with a caveat that, you know, I'm always guiding them to get there as soon as they comfortably can. Because if I get stuck here, then you're going nowhere, yeah. you know, and you're going to be miserable. And when we hold on to these limiting beliefs and stories about who my partner is because they cheated, mm -hmm. if I just hold on to this big, terrible story, then I bring myself down. And so a lot of the, the coaching and counseling that we do is around moving people forward without pushing them, you know, before they're ready, but to position them so they're more successful to be able to get excited about that new beginning, because that's where it all takes place. That's where the, the enrichment, the transformation, the possibility takes place is in redesigning our relationship. And so if I feel stuck, if I can just say that's ahead of me, it helps pull me in that direction. Yeah. I would, I would ditto everything Debbie said, but I would also just add that you know, I've had I've had couples where the the person who cheated becomes very impatient, and that is a real problem. Um, and I don't I don't really blame the person. I, I I empathize with the person. They want to move things along, but the person just isn't ready. And I have been in situations for six months where the person still was not able to move along. So you can imagine week after week after week being blamed. Uh, for doing such a horrible thing and how could you and you know things getting a little better and then a little worse and a little better But I do agree with Debbie at some point you At some forward. point you're gonna move forward. I had a couple in counseling for a year with infidelity and at the end of that year I could see that this was more than just an infidelity situation uh, I had a person who was deeply triggered and I think this person, of course, I knew at this point that it was a childhood abuse situation, a childhood wound that had been really triggered badly. So at some point, you have to sort of acknowledge that this person is always going to have this problem of being able to not forgive this person. Well, um, I don't know about always. Not always it, is not the right word. Yeah, but, you know. I think to, for me, the way I look at it is when it triggers that childhood wound, it's yeah. just an opportunity to bring it up and start healing it. And that's heal where, you know, I'll bring um, a, one of the cup, what the partner into individual to work right, on that right. um, childhood wounding. Right, right. Because it is a beautiful opportunity to work through that. And so they can, they can get the work done individually and then go practice it in the yeah, couple. Yeah. And without that, you can really get stuck in a loop yeah, that's going to yeah. go nowhere. The sexual abuse, we know one out of every four, I've heard women have been sexually abused. Yeah. So it's, you know that sexual abuse is going to show up a lot in infidelity issues. You have, uh, what is it? I've one heard of, it's like nine out of 10. Nine yeah. out of, it's, the, the it's number is astronomical. Yeah. Um, a quick question here. So you guys have mentioned a lot of transitions preceding affairs, examples having children, getting older, etc. 
What suggestions do you have for couples who may be switching seasons in their life to do preventative maintenance for the relationship? Mm, that's a great question. You know, for me, it's, it's not just doing something at any particular point in time. It's doing something all the time. So, you know, I'm a big proponent of, of a relationship practice. You know, like if you're learning a musical instrument, you practice every day and you're trying to get better and better at it. I put that much effort into trying to maintain a positive practice in my relationship. So I'm always working on re-romanticizing the relationship. I'm always trying to understand. Always? Often <laughs> trying to understand Debbie's needs and where I'm meeting them and where I'm falling short and vice versa. You know, uh, it's, it's just a constant thing. So when that season comes, so I do understand what you mean by that, that seasonal thing. I think one of the things that I would highly recommend around that time is a retreat, uh, a relationship retreat. There are so many great relationship retreats out there that led by wonderful. If you have any questions, you want to know more about that, you can email me and I'll send you a list of people who I really admire who do these kinds of, of couples retreats. We're going to be doing one. If COVID wasn't going now, we would probably be doing one this month. And sometimes just as asking, you know, one of the, when I work with clients, I, my famous check-in is on a scale of one to 10, where are you? Right. And what supports that number? Yeah. And I think that couples should just be doing that on their own. Mm -hmm. And, you know, are, where are you? I'm at a seven. What are you at a seven? Okay, yeah. how do we get it to an eight or a nine? Right. And um, it's important for the couple to have that conversation because... I mean, I can look online for all these different ideas, but it's what's going to turn the couple on. What's going to make them feel enriched and, and exciting and fun. Let's push it to the limit a little bit. Let's mm -hmm. do something a little bit outside our comfort zone. Outside our comfort zone. Yeah. So we have five minutes remaining, and I think we want to talk a little bit more about the phase three, yeah. because that's actually the exciting part. Yeah. You know, we've worked through a lot of this stuff, and now we're at a place that we can really redesign mm -hmm. our relationship and make it, more exciting and more connected and more sensual. Yeah. And really there's no limit to it yeah. because we've already worked on like my attitude toward you. I no longer hate you. I have compassion for you. I have understanding that it happened. And what I realized is that I was a little bit complicit as well. Yeah. That, you know, it's how I showed up in the relationship mm -hmm. that, um, that led to that as well. And, and I, I wanna show up differently now. Mm -hmm. And you do too. And I'm excited about this new beautiful thing that we can create. Yeah. And when we get to that part in our therapy, it's fun because it's almost like I was telling Craig, it's like, you know, for me, it's a lot like going through our premarital couples, you know, what's your vision for the future? What are your values? What are the guidelines? What are the, the rules in the relationship? Um, what are the fun activities? Um, what are the caring behaviors? It's all the things that we do for premaritals who are building life together because that's exactly what's happening. We have a new beginning. We had the gift of a huge breakdown and it really is a gift and it blew our relationship up, but we still want to make this work. And when you have those ingredients, blown up relationship, but we're both at the table and we're dedicated to making it work, I've seen relationships transform in a relatively short period of time but like off the charts, fantastic. So that's all possible. The gift of an affair can be um, quite large. And I'm not suggesting that you use it as a tool for transformation, um, but when it does happen, it really can be a gift. Another question. What part does, um, or can a relationship vision play in surviving betrayal? Hmm. You want to uh, yeah, I'll just... So a relationship vision is an opportunity to kind of look at your, your expectations, your goals for your relationship together. A relationship vision isn't looking at your individual goals, it's looking at your relationship goals. So that way you are both on the same page. You have a roadmap uh, to travel along and you're able to both be in agreement with that. Oftentimes, if we don't have that kind of vision together, we can begin going in different directions. So for example, sexuality uh, and sensuality, your goals for each other on that topic. You know, we want to explore new things. Do we want to explore new positions? Do we want to go to a sex store and bring some toys into our 
Uh, that's just one little area, we're right? We're creating together. We're, crea we're creating together. We're right. creating a new relationship together. Travel, um, family, uh, fun, health, all these things that as you start and it's exciting. And it's exciting because yeah. we're creating something together. I think, I mean, in its most simplest form, when you're at betrayal, you're at you wronged me. And, and on the receiving end, it's like I... I really screwed up and I've got shame and I've got guilt and there's blame and it's me against you. It's two individuals doing this together where when you have a relationship vision, you're like this and you're moving together. It's now us, the language changes. It's us, it's, it's, us. We. it's we, it's, you know, it's creation, even, it's possibility. And so there's blame to excitement. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a beautiful pathway into the future. You're looking at your future together. You're imagining your best self together in the future. So that's the yeah. vision, you know. So again, I think that um, affairs are painful. They're, they're awful. They, they trigger so much on both sides, both parties. And we so often just think of this person who got hurt as the only one having the emotions, but the person who cheated is also riddled with painful emotions. And when we just focus on the one that was hurt, we miss the true dynamic of what's happening. The person who went outside the relationship has a bundle of emotions and those need to be tended to too. Because if they're not, then you have emotional disconnection just continuing on in a really dangerous way for the relationship. So there's definitely a path, there's phases that you go through, um, but the ultimate end result can be, and often is, a beautiful, loving, transformed relationship. So Sarah's doing this, and that means we're done. Um, but if there's- You wanna announce that this is our last Mindful Monday? Yeah, so um, this is our final Mindful Monday for a little bit. We're gonna take a sabbatical. <laughs> we're gonna take some time off. Probably till September. Probably till September. And uh, just enjoy the, the summer, do some writing. Um, but most likely we will be back. And uh, we really appreciate all of you showing up over these last Mondays. We feel like we've traveled COVID together. And unfortunately, I felt at this point, we would be able to say, okay, go, go forth, enjoy your lives, enjoy your traveling, enjoy the restaurants. But that's just not the case. <laughs> But hopefully it's in our future, right? And, um, but we do appreciate you being here during this journey.